Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Nancy Knapp, the president of Western Maine Audubon. This is the first of three spring talks that we have planned. In um, addition to tonight's talk, we have in April, Stephen Kress coming to talk about the restoration of puffins on the coast. And in May, we will have someone coming who has been working with peregrine falcon restoration on Acadia. So we're hoping that you can join us for both of those talks. We're trying to be upbeat here with things that are coming back and getting better. Uh, tonight, uh, we are very excited to have Kyle Wanzer from Chewankee. He is speaking about predators, as you know. Kyle is a science educator for Chewankee's Traveling Natural History programs. And he most recently has been working as an outdoor school naturalist in this area and also in Ohio. Um, two quick housekeeping things. Nick has uh, wants you to put any questions in the question and answer box, please. And he'll monitor those and we'll get to most of those probably at the end. And also, just so you know, this is in webinar format. So um, everybody is pretty much muted and all audio should be off. And as long as the owl doesn't make a lot of noise if he's on your screen, um, I think we will just turn it over to Kyle. Take it away. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Hello everybody and welcome, no matter where you are, Across the state of Maine. So happy to be here joining you virtually. As she said, my name is Kyle from Chihuahua's Traveling Natural History Program. And today we're diving right in to talk about selfie. of predators. And so we're going to be meeting a number of live animals today during our presentation. They're going to be all different shapes and sizes with various adaptations, special advantages they have to help them survive and thrive and outcompete other animals in their home. But the thing that links them all together is that they are all predators. And as I think most of us are adults in this particular uh, discussion, I won't go too far into the, the discussion of what those are, but predators as a baseline are going to be animals that are hunting and eating other creatures, other living creatures. Uh, they are going to be the ones that are moving around in their territory, either finding ways of staying hidden and pouncing upon their prey or outrunning their prey and then grabbing onto them with adaptations that allow them to consume and acquire them. And the things they're hunting, the hunted, would be your prey. Uh, these creatures are going to sometimes be seen in kind of a negative light, unfortunately. When you hear the word predator, a lot of people assign a lot of negative connotations or negative associations to those words. They think of, you know, wicked or cruel or, or a killer. Uh, they think it's sneaky or mean. But I'm here to teach you that all these creatures are just living organisms that are doing their best to survive, to find food water, shelter, and space. And a lot of our associations there form from a perspective of fear, a perspective of maybe the, the hunter or the prey, when we want to kind of shift our focus onto the amazing adaptations and abilities they have and the amazing things they do for our ecosystem, helping to keep things in balance and uh, maintaining a part of that natural world. So we're gonna jump into some of our slides. I have my friend Colleen hidden behind the scenes, helping to pull up our slides here. Here's our, our splash page for Chiwanki's program. I'm gonna skip right past our expectations page. We normally talk about what we're expecting on Zoom call and move straight into this first slide. Thanks, Colleen. And you probably all recognize this as a scene from one of the classic fairy tales and an example of this negative association formed from old stories. Uh, in a way, a kind of propaganda against these predators. We vilify the big bad wolf chasing down Little Red Riding Hood here. Uh, this story is one of this creature of cunning and cruelty, sneaking in to the grandmother's house and devouring her, uh, dressing up and, and waiting, lying in wait for this little girl to come home so he can trick her and deceive her. And of course, predators are not really doing this in real life. Uh, the big bad wolf is only big and bad in our minds because of some associations that maybe early farmers and pioneers had with this creature. You know, it was true that if you had a farm, you had livestock, you were taking care of pets on that farm, uh, the wolves could be a, a threat. Uh, they could cause harm to that livestock or there could be a fear that they would. And so from that perspective, it's easy to see how they could become vilified. But we wanna shift our perspective and imagine ourselves from the hunter's perspective, from, from the predator. 
that wolf out in the forest is looking for food and established in its established territory, moving around and will come across evidence of humans moving through that territory. They are going to be uh, finding evidence of fields being plowed out, uh, forests taken down to make room for the, the grain and the fields uh, that these farmers are developing for their families. Not to be mean to the wolves, but to provide for their own families as well. And you're going to find a lot of this habitat loss will affect the wolves very livelihood. Wolves as a species are more hunters in the canopy of the forest. And that open area of fields and meadows is better suited for other animals like the coyotes. Uh, wolves in living in this territory we might see the big bad human as the, the villain of their own personal story. But again, neither of us, both humans and wolves, are the bad guys here. We're both living creatures doing our best to survive. I think with the kids, I would tell them, uh, imagine that you go to your bedroom and someone left a plate of cookies in there and it's covered up with a little tin. And you're like, oh, well, that's, that's weird that they're here, but so great, what a wonderful little treat. And as soon as you take one, someone bursts in and says, what are you doing with my cookies? How dare you, we are enemies now. And you'd be really confused and, and not really understand what's going on. And in a way, that's what it's like for wolves. Moving through their territory, they see a farmstead, they think, oh, look at this little smorgasbord, all these, these animals here behind this little gate. They don't understand property or territory. They don't understand they're doing harm to that, uh, that family. All they care about is providing food, finding shelter, and, and bringing up their own offspring. So we're gonna be thinking about these animals in terms of uh, a new uh, sign of light. We wanna be thinking about them in new words, uh, removing those negative connotations and focusing on some more positive ones. And to start with that, let's uh, jump into our very first uh, predator, one that we won't find in Maine. We'll just take a quick look at this slide of this beautiful cheetah. Uh, the spots here uh, providing a wonderful camouflage in the savannas where this animal is hunting. Look at those beautiful black lines under the eyes. You'll see this special adaptation or advantage these animals have. A lot of creatures that are very speedy, very quick creatures like falcons will have this little dark black line under the eyes. This really cool adaptation is going to keep the sunlight from bouncing up off of the lighter part of the skin and getting into the eyes. That could slow them down if there was a bit of a glare in their eyes and make it harder to hunt. So a lot of creatures that dark eye spot are going to have a better chance of moving quickly and seeing uh, at all hours of the day. You see this in football players. We do a little bit of biomimicry here, putting that eye black under our own eyes to avoid that little bit of a glare. If you ever wonder why people do that, that's part of the reason. We're mimicking that really cool adaptation of the cheetah. This creature could be seen as, as cruel or mean or sneaky, but I see a creature that is determined, that's stealthy and graceful, uh, that is moving through their habitat, looking for their prey. And this creature is a carnivore, an obligate carnivore, which means they don't have a choice. Uh, you and I are omnivorous. Uh, we can eat both fruits and animals, uh, fruits and veggies, plants and animals. And uh, when we choose to, some people might choose to be vegetarians or vegans, and that's totally cool. We have that ability to kind of choose that lifestyle for ourselves. We're still built to be able to digest both, but we have the means of only eating one or the other. This cat does not. Uh, this is an obligate carnivore, and right here is maybe a, a little bit of a disturbing uh, slide of them finally catching their prey and consuming that meat, which is rich in a lot of proteins and nutrients their bodies cannot produce themselves. They need to acquire this meat and consume it in order to survive. So they don't have a choice. They can't go and just be vegetarians. Um, and they're going to be hunting a wide number of other creatures, their prey, that are living in their particular habitat. In the case of this cheetah, they'd be hunting a lot of different creatures, but the next one we're going to show is a, a field of gazelle. So these beautiful, large herbivores uh, that are grazing and moving around in this territory. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're out in this beautiful habitat with all these gazelle, and they're living their lives peacefully, except for the constant threat of this predator, this fear of something coming and hunting upon them. From their perspective, of course, that uh, big bad cheetah is the bad guy, the villain. But let's say I snapped my fingers and removed all the cheetahs from the picture, made them all vegetarians, they no longer hunt these gazelle. Immediately, uh, those gazelle are gonna be like, woohoo, there's a party, you know? Uh, no more being hunted or persecuted, uh, no more uh, threat of a predator from above. The gazelle are going to uh, increase their numbers very quickly. Their numbers are going to go up and up and up, and they're living in the same sustained habitat, which means those same amount of resources they have. 
the plant matter that's there in this uh, particular habitat that they're grazing upon is going to quickly go down and diminish. As their numbers rise uh, and overpopulation becomes a problem, that can cause a major upset in that ecological system. And eventually, there may not be enough food to go around, as the next slide will show. Um, this is partially true in the real world. Uh, if I were to snap my fingers and make it so there's no predators at all, uh, that would be a very unstable system. Uh, you would have a huge imbalance in the number of uh, this population that goes up and then eventually a crash as they deplete the resources. It also causes a ripple effect to other animals that live in this particular habitat, other herbivores, plant eaters that are relying on the grass and greens here would not be able to sustain themselves as well as they quickly lose that resource. Um, and the very uh, sense of vegetation that's here is helping to hold the soil in place and provide nutrients. So without that soil, in an area that is overgrazed, the rain can wash away the, the rich soils into the rivers, widen those rivers up, cause uh, erosion in that area, and affect the very uh, biodiversity of that particular habitat. We saw this in an exchange in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, when wolves were extirpated from that area, no longer around, uh, they had a change in the biodiversity that was there. And recently, very exciting, uh, when the wolves were reintroduced, they saw that change again. They saw an increase in biodiversity as the wolves hunted the deer and other grazers, kept them from grazing in one spot too readily. So it kind of spread the love around. And in that sense, the roots were able to maintain the soil and the rivers themselves changed their bend just by having wolves there or not. So a single predator can be an important part of that ecological system. And the removal or addition of a predator to a system can have a dramatic impact. So thinking about that, those predators weren't the bad guys. Uh, they were just trying to survive and provide for their families. And they were helping to remove the weak or uh, the older population of deer, keeping the number uh, of deer that were there more sustainable, uh, sorry, gazelle here, more sustainable and healthier, uh, removing the ones that might have been a little slower or infirm, this survival of the fittest that happens. And I think that important distinction of survival of the fittest does not mean survival of the strongest. When it comes to predators, survival of the fittest can be a number of different play styles or specs, depending on what they're going for. You could be the fastest, you could be the stealthiest, the best uh, at surprising or ambushing your prey. There are a lot of different ways to be a very unique predator. And we're going to explore those with a number of different predators that I brought today. And the very first one we're gonna talk about, you can pull those slides down, Colleen. Uh, we'll move into our very first predator. It's a very small one that represents a number of predators that live here in Maine, maybe in your own backyard, maybe in your own house, uh, which many of you might not want to hear. Uh, this predator gets a bad reputation because of its form, of what it looks like, and a lot of stories that have kind of painted it in a very negative light. People that don't have knowledge about this particular animal can hear uh, stories of them being very scary or, or very dangerous, when usually that's not the case. With a growing bit of knowledge, uh, we can learn more about them and maybe have a, a greater appreciation for what they do and how they're really not as harmful as a lot of people think. The particular creature that I'm talking about today, the first one we're gonna meet is a spider. Uh, we have spiders all throughout Maine. There are 48,000 species of spiders, give or take, 48,200 species in the world, uh, which is kind of daunting. You just can't learn all of those. But in Maine, we only have about 40 species, which is great, it's doable. 20 of those, are your classic web building spiders, the kind you'll see hanging out in the web, being very patient and waiting for their prey to come to them. To get trapped in your web, they can go down, wrap it up, have a little bug smoothie. But the spider that we're meeting today represents the other 20 species of spiders that you could find here in Maine, the wandering spiders. These are the sort that are a little more hands-on, that are moving on the surface of the, the floor of the whatever habitat they're in, be it field, meadow, or forest, and springing or pouncing upon their prey to grab it. Uh, the spider that I brought is not one you would find in Maine natively. She is a Chilean rose-haired tarantula, a much larger and more dynamic representation of this particular species. Let me switch our camera so you can see her. And again, a bit of a trigger warning here. The big spider is about to show up on your screen. She's behind the screen. She is uh, totally uh, benign and harmless, especially to you, uh, again, with that distance. And I will actually reach in and, and show you just how sweet she is. Her name is Parker, for Peter Parker. Some of you may know of Spider-Man uh, is where she got her name and she can do all those things that are 
particular superhero is able to do, climbing uh, up sheer walls, uh, even though it seems to be perfectly smooth, a glass surface, she can climb it with those amazing legs and uh, grabbing on uh, to her prey and shooting webs as well. Although, as I mentioned, as a wandering spider, she's not building a web the way other spiders would be to be patient and waiting. She would use her weapon for a number of different things. Uh, she might make a carrying case and bring along her egg sac with her. You can see a lot of, oh, wonderful, Parker. You can see a lot of uh, ground spiders, like a wolf spiders in Maine, doing this. During the time when they have their eggs, they're gonna have this little white sack, this little kind of backpack of silk threads that have been wrapped up and they carry them around with them to keep them a little safer. They can also lay silk webbing down on the ground as a bit of a attraction, kind of like a, a safety net or a line they can use on a slippery surface. They can also lay a thicker webbing down and catch themselves in their own web, which might sound a little silly. Why would a spider catch themselves in their web? But the reason for that would be to emerge from their exoskeleton. This spider has an exoskeleton, a suit of armor around it that's keeping it safe. And it can emerge from that when it gets a little too small for its outer casing and have a new one fresh underneath. But it's kind of hard to slide out of that. Imagine trying to like slip out of a tight pair of pants without having use of your hands. Uh, you want to have a way to hold on to that so they stick themselves to the ground and pop out of it. I'm going to move her aside and show you an example of an exoskeleton right here. This is Parker's exoskeleton that was preserved. Sometimes people will find these, uh, these dead skeletons, uh, of these, these things that look like a dead spider in their windowsills or around their home and think, oh, good riddance, that, that darn spider. But in actuality, that spider just left this old exoskeleton behind and popped out larger and better than ever. They can even regenerate lost limbs during this time. If they were to lose a leg, they can grow it back during the process of molting out their old exoskeleton. And if you're thinking, oh no, there might be a spider in my house, fret not. Uh, there are virtually no uh, deadly venomous uh, spiders in Maine. Many of them have a venom uh, that is not harmful to us or have mouth parts that are unable to break the skin on humans. So most spiders are not gonna be uh, too much concerned. concern. There are a few that can be dangerous, but usually they're not seeking people out. Uh, you are not on the, the menu as, as it were. They are insectivores hunting the tiny little insects and liquefying their insides with the venom they have. My friend Parker is fangs. She's not defanged. She has her fangs and she is venomous. And I'm gonna reach in and show you that she is a sweetheart who would only really uh, bite or defend herself if she felt threatened in some way. Most spiders are like this. They're just living creatures trying to survive, defend themselves and their families. Uh, most predators are gonna be seeking out places to stay safe and usually running away unless they have no other recourse in which case they will defend themselves. She has beautiful eight legs that are sticking out. If you're counting, you might think, wait a second, Kyle, that's 10 legs. But those front two are what we would call the petty helps. Kind of like an arm uh, that's gonna help, kind of part arm, part mouth part. It's gonna help her pull her food in to her chelicerae, the mouth part that is on her belly. Can't quite show you that mouth part without flipping her over and that wouldn't make her very comfortable. So I'll leave her be there. You can see her eyes, eight tiny eyes, all together in that one little spot in the center. It almost makes her look like a cyclops. And in the back, those are her spinnerets. Two little appendages that help her weave her webs. Because even though she doesn't build a web up in the sky to catch a predator or to catch her prey, she is going to be using that webbing to catch herself and help her to shed that exoskeleton. I had a question, why does Parker not consider me a threat? And the reason is, uh, one, I'm not being aggressive in any way. I didn't come down and grab her uh, in any kind of aggressive manner. And she's kind of used to us from spending an extended period of time here at our wildlife center. Tarantulas can live a long time. The males uh, around 10 to 12 years. And this female could live up to 25 years, which is much longer than your average spider. And she has uh, a lot of different ways of sensing the world around her, most of which being those bristles that can sense vibrations, and even some chemical changes in the air, kind of smelling and feeling with those bristly ends of her feet. And so in a way, uh, she could maybe sense that there's no uh, scary chemicals around, no scary scents, and also know that uh, in the way that I'm handling her, uh, I'm not trying to hurt her anymore. Most spiders out in the wild too, even ones that have never met you, if you are not aggressive, if you're not trying to actively grab or hurt them, not making any sudden movements, they don't see that as a threat. And they usually, again, won't attack unless they have a means to. 
That being said, a lot of times people will be bitten and not understand. There's a miscommunication or misunderstanding uh, there. They may have been close to that animal without even realizing it, maybe even stepping down on an area where there was a home or a nest. I've heard of so many kids telling me that bees or hornets are so mean because they came and stung me for no reason, but they might not have realized that a lot of hornets or, or uh, bees uh, could be ground nesting and you could have stepped on their hive uh, or stepped close enough that they felt that there was a threat to their home. So for that reason, again, uh, a lot of it comes out of misunderstandings and miscommunication. And we're the big jolly green giants to them. Uh, we're much, much larger. It can seem very, very scary from their perspective. I'm gonna bring her just around so you can kind of see those different uh, beautiful bristles on her. Those hairs that she has on her legs have hairs in them. And the hairs and the hairs have hairs, and the hairs and the hairs and the hairs have hairs, and those hairs on the hairs on the hairs will help her to cling to those smooth surfaces. Tiny little grooves, she'll have the extra traction and let her climb uh, even you know, like a glass panel or a plexiglass panel, like her enclosure. She's able to climb that with relative ease. But as big as she is, she's kind of fragile. Uh, I wouldn't want to bring her up any higher than three or four feet because a drop from that could rupture her body, even though she seems really big and robust uh, tarantulas can be a little more delicate and we want to make sure that they're staying safe. So I wouldn't have her too high up for fear of her jumping, leaping, and maybe damaging herself. Just going to check for any quick questions before I go on. If you have any questions, we'll have uh, some time at the end to answer more about our predators. But for now, I'm going to place her inside and continue on with our discussion. But I just want to uh, highlight that predators don't always have to be these big, scary beasts that we think of. Sometimes the smallest of animals can be a predator. A predator is simply a creature that hunts other animals and consumes them for food. And so bullfrogs and bats and spiders, all these smaller animals are also predators, hunting for creatures in their own. Uh, look at those spinnerets. She's wiggling them around. I think she's currently weaving a small bit of webbing beneath uh, there to give her a little bit of extra control as she moves. So I'll pick her on up, place her on back. Great job. Thanks. Thank you. I'll switch us back over here. Welcome back. And uh, we're going to dive right into some physical adaptations, things that are on predators that might help you recognize them as a predator. Adaptations are advantages that help these animals survive and thrive in the nocturnal world or in their uh, particular home or habitat. And the slide that Colleen just brought up is a very adorable shot of the cheetah's cubs, reminding us that just like um, while they may be vilified by the gazelle and be seen as the big bad cheetah, the big bad wolf, they're doing this for their family, surviving, thriving, providing food, water, shelter, and space for their family back home. Thanks, Colleen. You can move to the next slide here as we talk about uh, these different creatures living maybe around Maine. We're going to move into some more Maine native species and talk about the physical adaptations they have in their body that help them locate and acquire their prey. That's the two big things you want to think about when you were a predator finding a means of locating your prey with your senses and getting to your prey, either by speed, like the cheetah, or by other means, like stealth camouflage or pouncing upon them, and having means of holding on to and consuming them with sharp claws and teeth. When I look at this creature here, and if you want to throw in the comments what creature you think it is, I'll reveal in just a moment. These are a uh, species that we have here in Maine. A clue for this is that it is a little less common in Maine than maybe another creature that's similar, but is a lot more common. There's only about 1,000 of these adults in Maine uh, natively right now. Uh, and they're more north and western, uh, around kind of the edge of their territory. They have this beautiful body that has this cryptic camouflage that helps them blend in to their natural habitat. And that's a really great adaptation for sneaking up in your prey. Not just the prey wants to stay hidden, your predators want to as well. Because every little bit of energy you have to run after something is energy you're wasting. If you can wait and let them come to you, uh, it's going to be much, much easier to catch them. And remember, this is hard to do. Uh, usually when this particular creature goes out and hunts, uh, they're going to spend four, five, six times trying before they can catch the animal they're seeking. And I do have the right answer in the comments. Thank you so much. That is a lynx. Very good. Sometimes confused with a bobcat. Uh, the bobcat is going to have shorter little ear tufts, a little tufts of fur on the top there, and a slightly longer tail. Um, this particular creature here, has those longer ear tufts, which can help them sense the world around them, a little shorter stubbier tail. Those eyes are an important part of locating their prey, and most hunters or predators are gonna have forward-facing eyes. Think eyes in the front, you're looking to hunt. Eyes on the prize. It's gonna help you find and scan the surroundings with all of your senses at once, 
Uh, so you can pick up any small little bit of movement, any small variation in the habitat there uh, that might be a camouflage animal hiding. And those ears on top, big, large ears, you can see that in a lot of wolves, coyotes, canines, foxes, uh, as well as a lot of prey animals like deer or gazelle or bats or mice. Uh, these big, big ears are gonna help to increase their hearing and they can turn them to focus in whatever direction they need. But what I think is really cool about the lynx is those little tufts on top. They're attached to very sensitive nerve endings on the top of the ears there, and they can sense very minute vibrations in the world around them. So when there are creatures moving in a submivian space, the space under the snow or the leaf litter there, they can sense that. They can feel those tiny vibrations and be able to hunt them more effectively. And the prey that my particular friend, the lynx, is hunting is going to be predominantly the snowshoe hare. So I'll move to the next slide. Thanks, Colleen. That snowshoe hare there is a great example of the prey that are out there and how their adaptations are just a little bit different. This is a big game of hide and seek out in the forest and it pays to have the very best adaptations to help you survive and win that game. If you are in the forest as a tiny prey animal like this hare and you're not quiet enough, stealthy enough, have the means of locating an animal that wants to hunt you very quickly to get away or freeze, then you're gonna get eaten. And if you're a predator and you don't have those means of survival and, and locating your prey, you're gonna go hungry. This snowshoe hare had those big ears on top, just like the other, are listening in all directions. And look at where the eye placement is. Eyes on the side, you're looking to hide. So eyes in front, looking to hunt. Eyes on the side, you're looking to hide. That gives a much greater field of vision that allows them to see any small movement in any direction around them. They can focus their attention and either freeze in place using the camouflage of their body, that cryptic coloration to blend in and hide. We call this catalepsis, when an animal freezes in place and uses their natural camouflage to blend in. You probably most understand this from the deer in the headlights effect. When a deer runs in the road and freezes, it's using catalepsis. If it was in the woods, that would be perfect. In the road, not so much. But that instinct tells them, stand still, so they're not spotted. Another instinct might be to run, and the snowshoe hare is incredibly quick in short bursts. They use that energy to quickly get away uh, to hide under a burrow and stay safe from the predators. And the feet of both the snowshoe hare and the lynx are incredible with fur between the toes there and spreading out their weight like a pair of built-in snowshoes, keep them off of those thicker areas of snow on the surface so they're not wasting energy and they can move quicker and uh, quickly get away. Amazing. Uh, let's go to uh, the next slide, Colleen, and talk about nocturnal adaptations. So day and night can change the world and landscape around us, and night affords a cover of darkness that a lot of animals are going to take advantage of. And if you are living in a world of the night, you have to have means of staying a little warmer. It's a colder, wetter world out there. And also being able to locate your prey when they have this extra veil of the night. So a bat here is not blind. A lot of people hear the expression blind as a bat. They can see just fine, but they rely on those ears and that echolocation to locate prey, even in the cover of full darkness. If they were to fly into a cave, it doesn't matter how good your night vision is, uh, without a photon of light, without a little light particle coming in, your eyes can't see. And so even in pitch black darkness, these bats can navigate around through the stalagmites through their cave and also ping the little insects with that echolocation and catch them up in those teeth. I want you to think about, again, those two big things, locating and acquiring. And we can break it down to three if you want, to locate an animal with your senses, to move to that animal in some way, and then to grab onto them. So with our bats, they're going to locate with those big, big ears. Uh, they're going to move to the animal with their wings to be able to fly very quickly to them and then grab onto them with their very sharp teeth or uh, every so often uh, the, the little, uh, little claws there. Animals using their claws and their teeth to sink in and grab their prey. Thanks, Colleen, can you pull that down? I wanna show a few skulls to kind of hammer home that point. As a predator, uh, creatures are gonna have means of acquiring, but also tearing apart their prey with their, with their adaptations in their mouth parts. And you and I technically are a predator. We are uh, more omnivorous, not a carnivore, not strictly just eating meat, but we were a predator back in the day. We traveled across the world uh, hunting a number of charismatic megafauna, some of them to extinction, RIP giant ground sloths. Uh, but we have the means in our own mouth to rip and tear meat with our canine teeth, our, in, our uh, teeth that are designed for ripping and tearing meat. Don't use your fingers, but you can kind of feel your teeth and know you have your incisors for kind of chopping. You've got your the canines there for ripping and tearing and your molars in the back for grinding down plates. I have a few skulls with me to kind of show the carnivorous teeth of some of our predators here. 
This is the skull of a coyote. Uh, species that kind of moved in and kind of filled the niche that was left behind by a loss of wolves and mane. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but these teeth represent a lot of the canids there. Those big, sharp, carnassial teeth, even in the back where you have molars that would normally be flat, you're gonna see this ripped or serrated edge for tearing through meat. This is a, a mouth that is designed uh, strictly for predominantly eating meat. Compare that to a bear skull, which is a little more like our own. This is an omnivorous animal, and they have those big, sharp front teeth uh, that are gonna help them rip and tear. But in the back, molars that are flat for grinding down plants, very similar to our own mouth. Obviously, our mouth is not as elongated, but you have a means of eating both. And so do a lot of predators. A lot of predators are omnivorous. Um, there are some obligate carnivores that have to eat only meat. And some of the ones we're going to meet today are only eating meat. But uh, others are going to have a little bit more of a refined and expanded palate. The next animal we're going to meet is going to be using that expanded palate to uh, kind of explore and, uh, and hunt for other animals. And uh, our tarantula friend is uh, exploring uh, around the table here. She's uh, very excited and, and kind of popping her head out. But before we meet that, that second animal, uh, I want to show one final animal on a slide. This is an animal that might surprise you, it might alarm you. It's another big cat that lives in Maine. You might have some in your own neighborhood and not really know it. Uh, they are a fearsome predator. <gasps> ah! This cat here might get a, a reaction of like, oh, how cute. But it is still a fearsome predator. Remember, size is not everything. And to that small mouse, that's the big bad cat out there, hunting songbirds and mice and other small mammals all around Maine. Uh, cats were not native to Maine here, uh, not this domestic version, and they are going to be an introduced species, especially if you have an outdoor cat that's going around. A lot of farmers would get cats as mousers, kind of help keep down the rodent population around their farm, but cats can be responsible for killing billions of songbirds every year as a whole, uh, and millions and, and uh, of these other rodents that would normally be in the food pool for the animals that are out there. So an addition of a predator, just like a removal of a predator, can have an impact on that ecological system. We have so many uh, smaller creatures that would be food for other larger animals being removed from that system because of wild or feral cats. And most of the time, these cats don't need those animals. Uh, they're hunting on instinct or play, and they're getting their own food at home. So small PSA, if you have a cat, uh, I live an indoor cat myself, if you have an outdoor cat, maybe consider a little bell for them. Give those other animals a little bit of a head start to do that that predator coming. An animal that you should maybe really love more than that cat uh, farmers have on their farm natively, but don't get the same kind of love and respect because of folklore and stories and misunderstandings about them, would be your snakes. And our next animal that we have is a species of snake native to Maine, one that has gotten a, more of a sour or negative reputation as a result. Here she comes. Say hello to Adder our Eastern milk snake, who is an average sized milk snake here. Uh, they can get approximately the size as they grow up. Uh, she is in a very unique state right now. I'm gonna show you in just a moment her eyes, which are a little pale and milky, uh, which is not where they get the name milk snake, but all snakes undergo this molting of their uh, outer scales or shedding. Uh, similar to how our exoskeleton of the tarantula could pop on off and allow them to grow uh, bigger underneath. These snakes and all reptiles are shedding their scales when they get a little too snug and they get a little too old to have a fresher set underneath. Well, the snakes are shedding all of those scales at once. These scales are kind of like your fingernails. Go ahead and look at your fingernails. Think about how they're shiny, but they're not wet and slimy. A big myth of snakes is that they're slimy and gross, but they're silky smooth. They're just like your fingernails, dry and silky, soft and hard at the same time, kind of flexible, able to protect your fingers, this is like a chainmail fingernail armor, ooh, even over their eyes, like a pair of built-in goggles, protecting their whole body as they move through their habitat. Because those scales are over their eyes, they don't have eyelids, they never blink, uh, those scales are going to be coming off when they shed their skin. And to help shed their scales, they're going to have a little slick layer of oil that kind of comes up between the two layers of scales and helps to kind of remove them. And that oil, when it builds up between the scales and the eyes, can make their eyes look kind of a milky blue or gray. I don't know how well you can see that there. There you go. She is in the process of preparing for a shed or a molt. 
And that can be a very dangerous time to be handling a snake that doesn't know you especially. Uh, when these snakes are molting, they, their vision is quite impaired. Uh, I keep saying molting, but shedding is more of a common term. Uh, when they're shedding their scales here, that vision can be impaired by those scales coming off the eyes. And so a hand coming down, even if it's a friendly one, might look just the same as a big shadow of a talon coming down and a hawk or a, a larger predator to grab these animals. They are predators themselves and carnivores, but they also have to worry about being hunted or predated upon by other larger animals. And so the most likely time for this particular animal to bite or strike out is out of fear, that fear and defense of itself. And while we've never been bitten by our friends here, we're always very careful and we usually don't handle them, especially on live programs uh, when they're in the state. But I thought as a, a virtual program, she only has me handling her. It's a great time to see that adaptation and uh, give you a chance to, to learn more about it. Snakes make amazing uh, friends to farmers out in the forest. They're kind of a symbiotic relationship, getting the, the rodents and other creatures that might be a pest or spread disease on a farm and help reduce those numbers. And they are non-venomous. We don't have a single venomous snake in Maine not sent the timber rattlers, which were extirpated around the 1870s. There's some rumors and some reports of maybe seeing a few coming back in Southern Maine. So we may have them eventually returning to Maine, which is kind of cool. But uh, as of now, you're most likely to, when encountering a snake in the wild, be running into one of nine native species of snakes that are all constrictors, that are not gonna be venomous in any uh, significant way. Look at that face there. Look at that tongue sticking out to smell the world around her. She sticks that tongue out, wiggles it around, gathers up scent particles, draw back to the roof of her mouth where she can smell it's her own olfactory senses that are picked up there. And she's gonna hunt her prey by grabbing on, wrapping her body around it and squeezing it in a constricting fashion. Uh, they're not gonna crush their prey to death so much as suffocate them. They're gonna hold on to them really tight. When that prey breathes out, they tighten up a little bit so they can't breathe back in. And then once the prey kind of goes to sleep, they're gonna swallow it down head to toe, usually uh, making sure to go with the fur. It's a little harder on their digestion if they're going backwards there. They can eat an animal maybe three to four times larger than their head because their head can open up quite dramatically. They can't unhinge their jaw, but they can open up with a secondary hinge that lets them open like us, uh, uh, and then open again with that secondary hinge. So open and open to get much wider around their food. If you could have uh, a mouth part like a snake, you could eat a watermelon or a Thanksgiving turkey in one big bite. I don't know why, why you'd want to, but you could. That's pretty amazing. Again, uh, a lot of fear that around snakes uh, for just their maybe scary looking nature uh, has led to a lot of mythology and folklore around them. It's just not true. The name milk snake comes from the thought that these snakes would sneak into a dairy and maybe suck the milk out of a goat or a cow. Some even believed that they would curse the cow, a devilish serpent uh, that would cause their cows to go dry or go fallow and not be able to produce milk. And so they were a kind of a scapegoat, uh, allowing people to blame it on the snake as opposed to just the natural uh, consequence of something that just might happen in the world. And as a result, a lot of people would fear these animals and kill them, when in reality, they were helping out in the farm. Even though they're not intending to do it, they're not doing it to be kind. They're just, again, a living creature looking for food, water, shelter, and space. My friend Adder here came in looking for shelter in the winter when it got very cold. It's a cold-blooded creature. She can't make her own heat. So she tucked herself away into uh, a nice warm basement of someone's house and snuggled up against the wood-burning stove. And that was a little too warm for her. She ended up burning herself along the back. There's a dark line that doesn't really match the, uh, the splotches there. You might be able to see it right there uh, between those two dark splotches. The spots are her pattern, but that stripe on her back is a burn scar. She was badly burned and had to stay in for multiple uh, sheds of that scales to make sure that she felt healed properly. And once she was fully healed, she was just a little too social. She got too used to people that wouldn't be very safe for her out in the wild. So she became an educational ambassador here at Chihuahua. All right, she's getting a bit squirmy here. Again, if you have any questions, you can add them in the chat or save them for our Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna pace her back and we'll move on with our discussion on predators. And since we were just talking about uh, these creatures that were native to Maine, maybe extirpated like our timber rattler, I wanna focus on one that is kind of in the news right now, uh, the wolves and how they were once upon a time, uh, a very uh, abundant and native species to Maine. Wolves uh, ruled over the, the forests of Maine. They hunted under the canopy. And when pioneers came and settlers 
who are cutting down and deforesting certain areas of their farmlands um, and also killing these wolves out of fear of them, it did greatly diminished their population numbers. Wolves uh, had that big bad wolf reputation. Those stories spread for a good reason as these wolves would hunt livestock and uh, cause problems for farmers and hunters in the area. And so there was a bounty placed on these wolves' head. A uh, certain number of uh, coin was offered per pelt of the wolf. And you can see a picture here of, unfortunately, dozens of wolf pelts lined up as they were hunted uh, very quickly out of Maine. That word extirpation is a fancy way of saying they were hunted to uh, essentially local extinction. There are no longer any wolves native to Maine. With the exception of a recent discovery found, I believe, in November of last year, there was some uh, scat found in the forest that was identified as having uh, a large percentage of wolf DNA. So they believe it was uh, most likely a wolf coming down from Canada, moving into uh, Maine uh, as part of a new established territory. There's a lot of discussion and question of whether or not wolf was just kind of sightseeing, moving down and, and traveled back out, or if it is living here now in Maine, and we're seeing a reintroduction of the wolf species coming back to Maine. Uh, that opens up that age old question discussion of do we want wolves back in Maine? And for conservationists and people that you know love to see that ecological biodiversity and richness, uh, we definitely say, yes, yes, bring them back. Uh, let's see a reintroduction of the species. But understandably so for farmers and hunters and people who those wolves could affect their livelihoods or their livestock, uh, there's gotta be a balance there. There has to be a way of uh, keeping those wolves in uh, areas that they can hunt effectively, that they can be protected, while also not harming or causing uh, concern for the, the humans that are living in that area. So until that discussion really gets fully fleshed out, until we think of a way that we can live and peacefully coexist together, um, it's kind of difficult to say we should just quickly bring them all back. But hey, maybe happening naturally over time as we're seeing some of these changes in the, uh, the population. We also see strange changes happening in terms of hybridization. Uh, there's been talk of wolves and coyotes uh, interbreeding and forming coyotes uh, that are larger coyotes that can make use of the, the open plains and fields. Coyotes are better suited for a number of different habitats. They're more adaptable than the more forest-centered wolf species. So we may see a, a wide variety of changes happening over time with those species. I'm seeing where in Canada is the closest to Maine wolf population. Um, I'm not native to Canada. I don't know a lot about the territories happening up there. I do know that in Southern Canada, there are a number of wolf populations around there. And so it's not a stretch of the imagination that the territory could extend and they could find their way south here to Maine. But um, in terms of specifics, I, I don't know that. Uh, I, can I can try to speak more on that as we go into our Q&A, but um, I'm not entirely certain on that myself. Uh, one creature that I'm more certain on, and our final creature we're going to meet today, is one that hasn't gotten that negative mind, that negative uh, perception. And this is a creature that is native to our, our forest of Maine, uh, is a creature that hunts more in the dead of night, and it is a creature that is flying far above one I need to use my own protection uh, when bringing out, because this creature is uh, a larger predator that has adaptations that could cause me harm. You notice I put on a glove, this little glove here is going to protect me from the very strong talons of our final creature, that owl. Uh, we're gonna bring out the largest and oldest uh, wildlife ambassador that we have here at Chihuahua. He was born in 1994. Uh, he came to us, uh, found underneath some high altitude power lines uh, and believed to have been struck by the fighters mine from hunting and damaged his wing. Which is why he lives with us as an educational ambassador. Everyone say hello to Sparky, the great horned owl. Sparky here has uh, a physical handicap that prevents him from going back to the wild. So if Sparky, can you put your wings out for me? You gotta see that big, broad wing there. Uh, those big, broad wings allow them to fly very silently. And he has a wingspan three times larger than its height. But both wings didn't extend because the wing on this side is no longer functional. When he damaged that wing and broke almost every bone in that wing his first year of life, he was able to have that recovered. He was taken to a rehab center and that rehabilitation center was able to put a cast in that wing, allow him to heal. But when that wing healed, the joints kind of stiffened up, became a little harder to move and he's not able to operate that wing anymore. He can extend it fully so he can no longer fly. And without being able to fly, he wouldn't be able to hunt successfully and compete in the wild 
which is why he lives with us as an educational animal. He is 27 years old, which is remarkable for a great horned owl. He lived to be about 25 on average in the wild. 20 to 25 is getting up there in old age for an owl. Usually, uh, sad to say, four out of every five first year owl won't live to see their second year. They won't live to see uh, year two because of competition, lack of resources, finding an establishing territory, a little bit of human involvement, just rough to be an owl. But once you get that established territory, once you have uh, an adult owl in a home knowing what he's doing, uh, they can live much longer. Their survival rate goes way up. And then eventually, um, if they get a little older, they start to slow down. They could be predated upon by other animals or they might have a hard time finding food, which is why the numbers kind of level off at 20 to 25 in the wild. We expect our friend Sparky here, who's fed every day, he's a little butterball and uh, has a great enclosure that keeps him safe. Uh, is going to live much longer than the expiration date in the wild. Sparky is a great example of those adaptations you can see on predators. Look at that big beak, slight, partially open it there, so you can see how wide that is, as he gives me a little nibble there. Uh, the big curved beak, like a built-in viking fork, for cutting and tearing smaller, uh, larger prey in smaller chunks. He's not grabbing with his beak, he's hunting with those talons. His limbs are going to help him uh, acquire his prey. Big, strong wings are carrying him there and big strong talons for capturing and grasping his prey and that beak for ripping and tearing away. His big, big eyes there are about as large as my eyes in a much smaller frame. And they're gonna allow him to locate his prey with vision eight to 10 times better than us. So an amazing sense of sight, an amazing sense of hearing. His whole face is like a built-in facial disc there, a channeling sound to his ear holes in the side of his head that allow him to hear his prey from over a half a mile away. Uh, which is incredible. If a little mouse squeaked on the other side of a football field, I'd have a hard time hearing it, but he could. And they can hear differences in the sounds that these rodents make, a mouse or a bull or a shrew, all make different sounds as they scurry, and he can associate those sounds and know what to hunt with, whatever he likes. They've even been reported to be able to hunt pregnant mice over non-pregnant ones preferentially, which is incredible. They can hear a little difference of a pregnant mouse who's dragging its belly on the forest floor and know to hunt for that because it means more food. So an incredible senses to help them locate their prey, incredible means of acquiring their prey through getting there by flying down and then grasping and then using that to the And this is not a hunter that is spending a lot of energy flying around and wasting time. They are perch and pounce hunters waiting in place using that natural camouflage to blend in. And when they fly, their feathers that look fluffy and fluted or frayed along the edges are gonna be very silent and quieter than a moth in flight, allowing them to sneak up and grab their prey. I'm gonna keep Sparky out and uh, bring us into our kind of Q&A section uh, about our friend Sparky or about uh, hunters and predators in general. I want us to think about predators and maybe how some of them can be seen again with that negative light. How we wanna kind of shift our focus there, think about them as just living organic creatures out there trying to survive, not being mean or cruel, but just trying to defend themselves and how our expectations or our stories we tell about them can change the way we see them. I bet no one would go out there and be like, oh, it's the big bad owl. Most stories have owls as the heroes, as wise keepers of knowledge, uh, as a messenger in Harry Potter, uh, these regal creatures that look maybe cuter or fluffier to us than maybe the spookier snakes and spiders. Uh, so our owl friends got the, the good side of the publicity stick, uh, but we wanna shift that, that focus on our other animals too. I'm seeing a question from Carol and Roger, what does our milk snake eat? Here at Chewonky, we feed our milk snakes mostly mice that have been uh, unthawed. We keep a, a large supply of frozen mice that we thaw out and warm up the temperature. And then they get fed once every two weeks, which seems crazy, right? I would go hungry if I had to wait that long. But as a cold-blooded or ectothermic creature, they're not burning energy every day to keep themselves warm like we are. Every time we eat food, part of that breaks down for energy and some of that loses a latent heat to keep us warm. Birds and mammals, are gonna be warm-blooded creatures and we're constantly burning energy, constantly have to replenish with food. But cold-blooded creatures, they don't spend a lot of energy. And especially during winter time, they can brew mates, which is kind of like hibernation, slow way down, and they can go even months without eating. Question, uh, do Sparky's talons have to be clipped? We do make sure to give our animals monthly health checks and that will uh, sometimes keep us uh, coping or clipping the talons and the beak. Uh, in the wild, that would be naturally worn down as they're going around on different surfaces, the trees, the rocks in the ground, uh, and as in hunting, 
just the general wear and tear would wear those down over time. But in captivity, he's not moving around as often as he would in the wild. And so sometimes his beak gets a little long and you might even notice it looks a little light on the edge there as we've uh, coped it down and, and kind of keep it in a better form. There. If it gets too long, that can cause some problems, even closing his beak, which we would never want. And same with the, the feet too. If they get too long and curled, that could be hard to stand on to cause problems for him. He could even puncture himself on the base, which would cause a lot of other issues. So monthly, our animals are all checked out, make sure they're healthy. We're weighing them weekly, uh, making sure they're all staying within the appropriate levels to stay safe and healthy. I see a question from, from Pete here. I've seen and heard owls at night in the woods. Why don't I see them in the day up in the trees? Great question. Owls are cavity nesters. So they're usually gonna be hiding away in holes in trees. They don't nest the same way that eagles or hawks would. So instead of having a big nest out on like a branch or in the open area, they're gonna be tucked away and hidden. And if they're tucked away inside of their little tree cavity there, even with their head sticking out, it can be really hard to spot. He's showing off those dynamic uh, kind of patterns on his back there, those different colors to help him cryptically blend into the trees. As a perch and pounce hunter, he's hanging out really close to the base of the tree and the bark of the tree blends in really well with this coloration. So they can be really, really difficult to spot even at night when they're out and about. Uh, he's showing off that gular flutter right now. We're under some warm studio lights and he's wearing a built-in winter coat. So he's kind of panting to cool down. I sweat to cool down uh, like most mammals, but uh, he has to breathe uh, air over his tongue. He's drawing it back and forth over the wet tongue to evaporate that out and cool him down. Uh, check to see, are there forest characteristics that owls are attracted? Uh, certain uh, owls are gonna have certain preferred habitats just like other predators, like I said, uh, wolves prefer a deeper, more forested area over the coyotes, which can hunt in more open areas and open habitats. Uh, with a great horned owl, they can be found in a lot of different habitats, jungles and uh, forest areas, and they're going to need uh, open, like wooded areas with some meadows and groves so they can hunt down on. Um, in terms of the, the different kinds of barks of trees, there's not any like known preference for one particular tree over the other that would give better camouflage, uh, but you do see other kinds of owls like barn owls, for example, having different colors and preferring different habitats. A barn owl was not native to some areas like Maine or Ohio when they were fully forested because they need larger open fields. And I'm from Ohio originally, as was mentioned, uh, we would see barn owls much more commonly nowadays, but they weren't there before farmers uh, took down the forest of those areas and opened them up for farms. So barn owls move in those open barns, like open cavities, uh, just like an old tree cavity, and they love those open fields with quartering over their uh, over the fields looking for prey. So different owls are gonna prefer different types of habitats, but not particularly like different trees. I would say old trees that can have big open holes in them would be preferred nesting sites. So if you have an old say oak tree or uh, a tree that had like a big uh, limb that fell off and has an exposed cavity there, or sometimes for smaller owls, trees that have woodpecker holes in them that are open up wide enough, it has this exposed cavity, would be a great place for those owls to nest. Um, oh, you asked Spark to open his wings, and he did, yes. So that is a bit of a, a magician's trick. And since we're all friends here, I'll kind of fill you in on the trick. Sparky is not a trained bird. He's not smart. We call these owls wise keepers of knowledge, but they're really bird brains, no offense. Small, small brain in there, almost uh, a little smaller than the same size as his eyes. His eyes are so big, they pick up just too much space for a big old brain. And so he's really good at instinct and knowing how to survive in the forest. And part of that means balance. You might see how his back tail flips back and forth and his wing comes out as that tree branch or my arm moves. So get him to put his wing out. I just have to tilt my hand slightly to just put him a little off balance and put his wing out. I don't do it too often because I don't want to put him off balance and cause him any distress. But every so often, he's kind of used to that uh, for giving a little wave. That's a great way to show off that big, broad wingspan. Uh, these owls can have a wingspan between three to five feet on average. You're going to see smaller owls, uh, the great horned owls down south. Uh, or closer to the equator where they're uh, a little warmer. This is called Bergman's rule. Bergman's rule states that the closer you are to a very hot space at the equator, you wanna be small and slender to let that heat out, much larger surface area. When you're up closer to the poles where it's very cold, you wanna be big and bulky. You have a smaller surface area and more kind of meat on the inside to keep yourself warmer. So bigger animals seen up north where Maine is. That's why we have big, big mammals like moose and we have these big, big owls with a wingspan four to five feet as opposed to say, three to four feet down south. So cool. 
When should we expect to see snakes coming back out in spring? Once we start having warmer weather where there's nice warm days with lots more light, and you have those rocks and logs being warmed, it's the time when snakes will be coming back out. They don't have a full hibernation cycle. They're not sleeping all through the winter. Brumation means that on a nice, nice warm day or a bright day, it kind of triggers them to like, oh, maybe I could find some food today. Maybe I could get a little water and they'll wake up and explore. So once we start having some nicer days that are like a little warmer all throughout the day, don't have as much frost and snow on the ground, we'll start seeing those snakes returning to logs and rocks. Keep an eye out for them. But it won't be out fully until winter fully goes away. Because once it gets cold again, it will tuck back down under the frost there to stay safe in those hibernating days. Right. Trying to make sure uh, and if there are any questions I missed, I'm going to kind of scan back and look. Um, are yellow sack spiders native to Maine? I do not believe so, but I can double check. There are 40 species of spiders native to Maine. 20 of them are your web builders. 20 of them are your, uh, your wandering spiders. Right? 10 of those wandering spiders are jumping spiders, different species of the jumpers, which are so cool, one of my favorites. And then for web building spiders, about half of those are orb, orb weavers. So your garden orb weavers, the ones that build a really fancy like, spiral, spiral if you're used to. Others have more of a tangle web. And the yellow sack may be one of the tangle web ones, but uh, I'm not entirely certain. Like, I could probably give you uh, an answer in a, a few moments if I, if I look it up. I have like a full list that I've, I've kind of written out for myself. Um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. I don't believe a yellow sack is, is native to Maine based on what I'm, I'm seeing here. I could be wrong though. Maybe my friend Colleen, who is behind the scenes, can look it up to double check for me. How are we doing, Kyle? Are there more questions or are we coming to the end? I think we're coming to the end. I was just scanning through our, our scene here to see if there are any questions I missed. Um, but I really appreciate all your curiosities and I hope that you learned a lot about the predators we had today. Our tiny little spider represents those spiders we can find in Maine. Our milk snake, which is a native species here to Maine, one of the nine different species that we have moving around our forest. And our big kind of a uh, charismatic predator here, our great horned owl, native to Maine, and the largest owl you have in Maine year round. You can see larger ones like your snowy owl, they don't live with us for the winter. They're gonna be migrating in uh, during certain times of year. Well, thank you very much. I know that when we first started to plan this, we were gonna have you come with the animals, you know, and we would have all been together, but you've done a wonderful job presenting them on screen and uh, presented a lot of knowledge to us. And we really appreciate your, your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You can see uh, my friend's getting a little warm under the lights. I'm gonna put him back, uh, but thank you again for having us. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you in April uh, to talk about puffins on the coast. Thanks.